Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. And welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast where we discuss all things Carpenter all the time. My name is Alex. I will be your host. And joining me, as always, is Noel. Also your host. Indeed. A host with the most. And joining us again, I don't even really need to introduce her. It's Angie. Hey. (laughs) How many times is this now? The third time? This is 400th time. (laughs) Now we're doing two in a row. I hope y'all like me. <laughs> Who could not? Oh. We wouldn't have you on if we didn't. Well, I, I was mostly speaking to the listeners, but I'm glad y'all like me too. <laughs> <laughs> they better. <laughs> listeners don't tell us anything because nobody comments anymore. No, it's true. No, they really don't. <laughs> That seems to just have, like, died out entirely. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing? I don't know for sure. Sometimes it's a good thing. (laughs) Sometimes it's a good thing, But it is weird to throw these things out into the ether and then just hear nothing back. I know people listen. We see the numbers. That's true. (laughs) So, yeah, we are here to discuss, and this will be interesting because I just did a podcast on this one, like, five years ago. Mm -hmm. We are doing Village of the Damned. (laughs) (laughs) The thing was kind of a remake. This is, like, Carpenter's first full-on remake. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Of something else. Right, yeah. And I, I should just go ahead and ask, and I'll start with you. Have you ever seen Village of the Dam before in either incarnation? I have seen the John Carpenter Village of the Damned. It was a rental way back in the 90s, the year it was released. I remember enjoying it because Christopher Reeve was in it. And that's about it. Angie? Well, that podcast of five years ago you mentioned, it was one of those things where I think I was looking around on Netflix or whatever, and I was like, oh, look, both versions of Village of the Damned are available streaming. I can finally listen to that I Hate Love Remix episode. (laughs) So that was when I did. (laughs) And yeah, and then I, of course, did it for I Hate Love Remix. I'd seen both of them. Like, early 90s, I was really into, like, 50s and 60s sci-fi movies, so I had seen the original back in the day, and it always stuck with me. And then I know I saw the remake somewhere in that period in the late 90s after I'd gotten into Carpenter. Didn't think much of it then. We'll say what I think of it now. And again, five years ago, I recorded an episode. We'll include a link in the show notes to I Hate Love Remakes, our episode on Village of the Damned. This began life in 1957 as a novel called The Midwich Cuckoos, which was the seventh book by British author John Wyndham, who is probably best known for a novel he wrote called Day of the Triffids, Mm. one of the great apocalypse stories. Are either of you familiar with John Wyndham? I'm familiar with The Day of the Triffids. Only vaguely. I haven't really read any of his stuff. He's a very interesting, he's a little bit of a stiff upper lip British writer, but good stories, good concepts. One thing I would definitely recommend to you, Angie, especially as a fellow X-Men fan, is a novel you wrote called The Chrysalids. Okay. Which is about the increasing emergence of mutants who have special powers and about how society starts persecuting them. Hmm. And it was genuinely one of the influences on the creation of the X-Men when they did it back in the 60s. Yeah, it seems like it would have to be, right? That one's definitely worth a read. Day of the Triffids, fantastic book. And Midwich Cuckoos is also a very good proto-Stephen King book. I'm sure you will notice a number of similarities in the movie. Yeah. This was originally adapted in 1960 by MGM as a film called Village of the Damned, which followed up four years later by the sequel Children of the Damned. And I will say the remake, it follows both the book and the original pretty closely story-wise. There's not really that much difference. And for more of a discussion of the original film and comparing it to the book, I would definitely recommend people go check out that I Hate Love Remakes episode. Mm. MGM was apparently themselves batting around the idea of a remake back during the 1980s. 80s. But by the early 90s, the rights to both the original novel and the film had somehow shifted to Universal. I don't know what happened if someone bought something. I know MGM at some point started selling off their entire library, so I don't know if that was around the time. Mm-hmm. And among several directors it bounced around, most prominently was Tom Holland, who made a name for himself in the 80s as the writer of The Initiation of Sarah, The Beast Within, Class of 1984, Psycho 2, and Cloak and Dagger, as well as the director of Fright Night, Fatal Beauty, and Child's Play. 
And I haven't been able to find out any details of his version of Village of the Damned, but instead of this movie, he went on to make The Temp, The Langoliers, mm. and Thinner. There we wow. go. Okay, yeah. And I remember both of those were also pretty straight adaptations, so I have a feeling his version of this might not have been that much different. No, I mean, he probably would have just gone back to the novel right. and just on a straight... Well, to be fair, the original movie was a pretty straight mm-hmm. adaptation of the novel. I get just censored a few things, but yeah, no, and it would have been interesting to see it because I like Tom Holland's stuff for the most part. Langoliers is... It's a little wobbly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Bronson Pinchot. <laughs> So anyways, the film was initially written by David Himmelstein, who's a writer I'm not really that familiar with. This is one of only five credits he has. Mm. His only other films are Power, Talent for the Game, Soul of the Game, and Joel Schumacher's Bad Company, none of which I've seen. In our Memoirs of an Invisible Man episode, we mentioned that there was a six-year gap after Prince of Darkness before Carpenter was able to get another film off the ground. We were speculating a bit like what might have happened, was it issues with the studio? I found a Starlog interview where John talks about his contract with Alive Films, the company that produced Prince of Darkness and They Live. It turns out he did not have a two-picture deal with them. He had a four-picture deal Mm. with them. After those first two movies, they reneged on paying for any of his further movies, and he took them to court for, like, several years over breach of contract. Whoa. So that was just dragging through the mud and was a whole big issue. And it took a while during which he made memoirs, body bags, and In the Mouth of Madness. Somehow, because the Alive contract had Universal as distributors, it ended up with John still owing Universal a couple of movies. And, you know, this is after he had kind of had a bit of a troubled history with Universal. And his main thing that he wanted to direct was Creature from the Black Lagoon. (laughs) And that is one I do actually have the script to his version, and I will be doing like a genocrypha on them at some point. But Universal was like, hey, we need someone to do this movie first. Can you do this movie first? And John didn't really like the idea of doing like a straight on remake, but he liked the original Village of the Damned and thought he could take another stab at it. So he did it. And then Universal went through one of their, you know, those infamous industry studio head changes Mm -hmm. or, you know, the company president steps down and a new one comes in and just pisses all over everything that the last guy did. Yeah. Creature from the Black Lagoon was taken away from him. Village of the Damned was taken away from him in editing and marketing. Despite all that, Carpenter still likes the movie, but it did not do well. (laughs) And for some reason, Universal just let him out of the, he owes them a fourth movie. Unless they'll bring it up like now. Universal let John Carpenter make it. (laughs) (laughs) So anyways, John directed the film. He did an uncredited rewrite of the script and composed the score with Dave Davies. Now, are either of you familiar with Dave Davies? Nope. No. He was the lead guitarist of The Kinks. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Yeah, this is his only film that he ever worked on. Weird. So the film was produced by Sandy King, her fourth with her husband John, as well as Michael Preger. I can't find much info on Preger, as he only has a handful of credits. But he also produced the 2009 miniseries adaptation of John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids, as well as Vampire Academy. <laughs> oh, okay. And I'm not sure how this ties into the Trouble the Live Films deal, but the heads of that company, Shep Gordon and Andre Blay, are credited on this film as executive producers. So I'm guessing it's still tied into whatever fallout of that contract was. Mm-hmm. So this is cinematographer Gary Kibbe's eighth film with Carpenter, also returning our actors Michael Perret, Mark Hamill, though thankfully more clothed, Peter Jason <laughs> and Buck Flower. <laughs> Editor Edward A. Rochelka, stunt coordinator and now second unit director Jeff Amata. He took a little step up. Production coordinator Cheryl Miller, first assistant director Artist Robinson, second assistant director Christina Della Pena, visual effects supervisor Bruce Nicholson for ILM, mechanical effects supervisor Roy Arbogast, though neither the K nor the N nor the B of K and B were involved in this film, K and B <laughs> still did the makeup effects. Sound mixers Thomas Causey and John Dunn are still around, costume designer Robin Bush, key grip Harry Renz, script supervisor Benu Bandari, and after an absence of eight years... This marks the glorious return for his 11th John Carpenter film for Boom Operator Joe Brennan. (laughs) (laughs) Finally. On a quiet afternoon, the small town of Midwich is suddenly cut off from the world by an invisible field which knocks out anyone within its perimeter. Every townsperson is unconscious, some dead as a result of how they were knocked out, and any outsider or authority figure who tries to enter also collapses. It quickly catches the attention of the military, led by Susan Verner, who rushes in after the field dissipates. It's quickly learned that every woman in town is pregnant, including wives of husbands who were away and even a teenage virgin. Werner offers to assist in any way possible, whether it be by termination or financial support to any parent willing to allow their newborns to be studied. The children are born, and other than some mild physical abnormalities, seem normal. As they grow over the next few years, however, they begin to display mental powers which they use to lash out or control any person who wrongs them. 
a seeming lack of emotion, and a tendency to pair off within a collective group. The teenage mother, whose child was the only one who died in birth, commits suicide. This lack of a child leads to emotions in David, the son of Jill, whose husband was lost in the initial incident, and she realizes that David's loss of a partner is leading him to discover empathy. Unlike Mara, the leader of the children and daughter of local physician Alan Chafee, whose wife also killed herself shortly after Mara caused the woman to boil her arm off after giving her food which was too hot. Nobody is quite certain how to deal with the children who quickly advance beyond other kids in the area. When they decide to leave their families and create a new communal home for themselves in the farm where they were born, it's decided that Alan should become their teacher to try to appeal to any sense of humanity they might still have. It doesn't go well, and more and more of the people brutally die as they cross or openly oppose the children. It's ultimately learned additional communities were born on the same day around the world, most of whom have been destroyed by their governments to keep the children from spreading. It reaches that point here, too, as the townsfolk form a torch-bearing mob only for the children to cut them down, then turn soldiers on themselves as the military finally pours in. They even force Werner to autopsy herself when they realize she kept the dead fetus of their sibling for further study. Alan appears before the children, trying to distract them with a new lesson, but they realize he's hiding something. As they begin psychically breaking through the brick wall he visualizes in his mind, Jill recovers David from the group and they run away. As the last brick in Alan's mind crumbles, they see the bomb he's placed in his briefcase, just as it goes off. So Alex, do you recommend Village of the Damned? I recommend the first half hour, and then I strongly do not recommend the rest of the movie. (laughs) I thought the first half hour, if I would caught this on television, I would have been very interested to see what happens next. It's got a very strong premise, which I guess is the book and... (laughs) The previous films doing more so than this versions where I was really engaged and wanted to know exactly what was going on. I like the mystery of this closed blackout of people all falling down and stuff like that. And I liked seeing the ramifications of that. People actually died and what would actually happen. And then after that, they just do nothing with it. Then it's just a bunch of two old babies in silver wigs and a bunch of nonsense. The whole movie to me feels like it's comprised entirely of reshoots and edit shots and stuff like that. It just seems like a muddled mess. The acting is okay. The actors did what they could under the circumstances. I remember sort of enjoying this movie, but kind of knowing it wasn't that great when I first saw it back when I was like 15 or 16. So me to have an inkling that it isn't good means it's probably a very bad movie. Angie? I'm going to go with a light recommend. I certainly understand... Your feelings. Because it was like, I remember I was like sitting there watching it. And I'm like, yeah, I do remember. This is pretty good. I'm going to recommend this. And then like as it started to go on and the kids started killing people and it got a little cheesy and silly and do I recommend this? But I think ultimately it's a good Sunday afternoon stuck on TV, nothing else to do. Yeah, okay, sure. I'll sit down and watch this for the next couple hours. Why not? I wouldn't go out of your way to find it for sure. I recommend the 1960s. Of the <laughs> Damned. I mean, this one, it's not bad, and it does follow the story for the most part. It just feels kind of tired. It just doesn't have energy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have any punch. Instead of being scary, I mean, the scares all really come from the concept, mm-hmm. which predate this film. And every actual scare we get in the movie is just cheesy and silly. Very goofy. Yeah. Like that superimposed shot of the little baby girl closing her eyes as her mother jumps up. (laughs) Yeah. And even the whole glowy eye effects are so 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see why this started to mark the downswing. Because, you know, the earlier 90s Carpenter films, I was okay with. But this one is just, eh. And it's followed by Escape from L.A., which (laughs) we'll save our opinions on for that episode. But suffice to say, we already recorded it. (laughs) So we know it doesn't get better after this. Is the decline of John Carpenter kind of synonymous with the rise of CGI effects? Hmm. I think a large part of it is also the changing of film stock and the changing of camera lenses. Hmm. His shots are still composed exactly as they were in the older ones, but it's like the style of film, the style of the lighting, the way the lens is capturing it, it just doesn't have the same sharpness. And you don't get the same color. Like, they always used to use, like, the big blues and the reds and the greens. Right. Mm-hmm. To mix it in with, like, an understated realism. That just doesn't jump off the screen anymore. Everything just looks kind of dull. It looks like a TV movie. It literally yeah. looks like a 90s made-for-TV movie. Yeah, it really does. It needs the murkiness of the 80s for that mood that he used to capture so well. The grit and the grain, yeah. 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 And I gotta say, the little kids... 
little white-haired children with glowing eyes looked great in black and white. Absolutely. Right, yeah. In 90s color, it just all... And here's the thing, none of the kids are wearing wigs. They actually bleached every child's hair and then Wait. did a very stiff hairspray style to it. It looks like they're wearing Mara's wigs. Mara's <laughs> really look like a wig. I like, know. I could see David's being his hair dyed. That looked a little more natural, but hers looked super fake. And that's just the thing is, if it's going to look like a wig, why not just do a wig? Yeah. Yeah. Why put a little kid through that? Well, I mean, it's kind of like <laughs> the In the Mouth of Madness scene where I it's was like, thinking of he that. wakes up and everyone's blue. And no, they actually just got everyone right. in blue clothes with blue makeup. In realism, I guess. <laughs> yeah, on the boys, I think it looks fine, but on the girls, yeah. they look like they just have the identical bob wig. Yeah. I guess they wanted them to look like dolls or like, you know what I mean? Like they yeah. wanted them to look artificial, but yeah, why not go for a wig then? And you know, there is that line which goes all the way back to the book about how their hair follicles are slightly different, mm -hmm. how they're D shaped instead of round. Yeah, I noticed that. And that makes them look like they have wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I noticed they also have a line about how, did you notice their nails are narrower than usual? We never see their nails. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't play into anything. We never see an awful K&B makeup effect of fingernail. I kept trying to figure out if the eyes were, like, color-coded to what they were doing, but I couldn't see it. Like, it was just sometimes they're green, sometimes they're red, sometimes, I don't know. I think it, it's just they're green when they're using their powers. It's red when they're really using their powers. Ooh. And then white when they're really, really using really, their powers. Really. <laughs> and then, yeah, then the kind of like synth sound effects coming up under him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the whole bit there at the end where her face turns all alien. Oh, yeah, right at a Stargate very there. Goofy. <laughs> yeah, it did have that same look that we saw around that time of Stargate Independence Day of the arrival. Yeah. They all had that same alien style. Fire mm -hmm. in the sky. <laughs> And I got to say, though, a couple of these kids actually went on, like, the lead girl, was it Mara? I think yeah. it was Mara, yeah. Christopher Reeve's daughter. She's still acting today. I thought the David kid was pretty good, too. Oh, David, he's, either of you seen the Nightmare on Elm Street remake? Yeah, yes. I did. I don't remember it. That's Thomas Decker, who was the boyfriend of the girl guy. Oh, uh, okay. Um, if I saw a picture of him, I'd probably recognize him. You probably would. What I know him most is he played John Connor in the Terminator TV series. Oh, okay. okay. And he's very good. He still acts in a lot of stuff, does a lot of indie films. Very good actor. Let me just bring that up as a few of the things that they did change are the whole story of David being the one kid who, you know, I was supposed to be with her, but she's gone mm -hmm. now. And that leading him to actually gain empathy and actually kind of separate from the group. I liked that angle. I do. I like that addition, too. That was not anywhere in the original. Because in the original, what I liked about the kids is they're not evil. In the original novel, I should say, mm -hmm. they're not evil. They're just different. It's kind of like that X-Men thing of they're just different and everyone is terrified of them and they're terrified of everyone. Mm. So it's just leading to a confrontation between species. Let's see, what else was added? Uh, his wife dying was added. Very unnecessary. It was a sad moment, but I don't think you needed that after the whole putting the hand in the pot. Yeah. Right. A little excessive. He had a wife in the original. She just wasn't important in the story. <laughs> I think they wanted to make it so that he wasn't leaving his wife behind. Mm. The actress, Karen Kahn, I actually thought she was really good. Yeah, she did a great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know, we haven't talked about Christopher Reeve yet. He was fine. Yeah. I wouldn't say he was amazing or anything like that. I've only seen him in a few roles outside of Superman, and I think I've only really enjoyed one of those roles. He's good with, like, light comedies and stuff like that, but when he tries to get too serious, he's a little stiff. I'm sorry. Rest in peace, Superman. Well, see, I actually liked how he did the intensity. I just thought the problem was more the material he was working with. And right, yeah, I mean, well he didn't been. do anything wrong. He just didn't have a whole lot to do for the lead of the film. <laughs> I mean, like, if he had used that intensity to tell Batman my mom's name is also Martha, <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone with it. Mm -hmm. That's true. It might be because he could have done some amazing work that I haven't seen yet, but maybe it's just the material that I saw him doing. It's not even that it's bad material, but again, it's just so flatly directed. Yeah. yeah. But he was fine. I've noticed two, like, Superman references right off the bat where he comes out and he immediately puts his hands on his hips. And I'm like, that's Superman. <laughs> and then she comes out and she's like, can you read my mind? And I'm like, that's Superman. What was it when he was at that gas station? They said something to him. And I was, like, half expecting him to go, well, I'm not Superman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing he just jumps out with hands on his, his pose is just Christopher Reeve. He did four of those <laughs> movies, so maybe it's just what he does. <laughs> it's just ingrained in him, I know. He was yeah. It, yeah. I didn't have a problem with him. It, it was just, it didn't resonate. Yeah. There's just so much of this film where it's like, okay, I'm going with that twist. I'm going with that character. I'm fine with that. 
but it's not resonating because it's just so flat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for a man who, you know, lost his wife to suicide because of his child, and even, like, Mark Hamill's character, when he's getting all upset, like, you don't really feel it. No. No. At all. And I even, like, I appreciate the concept of, I love the whole thing about how he shows up and he offers his daughter his hand to take her home and she just walks right by him. Yeah. And then later at the graveyard, David walks up and takes his hand. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there's suddenly this bond between the two of them. I like that moment, but it's still not selling it. Right. No. It's like, there's a lot of this remake I like on paper. Mm -hmm. And I should also mention, a lot of the things that they added were the body count. I mean, in the original, they created accidents around the town, or they would get back at people, but they would more just hurt them, as opposed to, like, outright killing them. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed like they felt like they had to turn this up to try and make it a horror movie, but none of the scenes were really that horrifying. Like, Buck Flowers, the drunk janitor... (laughs) He's just suddenly in a classroom waving a broomstick at children. After yeah. drinking what looks like mouthwash. <laughs> what looks like the same bottle of mouthwash over five years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do like the moment when his broom connects with the kid and suddenly all the other kids shoot out of their seats. Yeah, yes. that was good. But then they have him walk backwards up a ladder. And fall onto his broom. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Whatever. Which in reality from that height, he would basically have a bruised spleen and that's about it. And then there was that time they threw a model car at a propane tank. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, he just showed up to pick up yeah, his girl. that was not justifiable at all. That's why I like the novel. And you know, to be fair, the original movie did also kind of make the kids a little overly evil. What I liked about the novel is it's more ambiguous. It's more just, you know, neither side is fully right or wrong. They're just at conflict. Mm. Mm-hmm. In this one, no, Mara especially. Mara is, She comes yeah, right out like, of the gate and kills her mom for no reason as far as I right. can tell. Like her soup is too hot. Oh no, no more for you. You need <laughs> to burn your entire arm off. Come on. And then jump off the, <laughs> the side of a cliff. <laughs> right. Yeah. The suicide, I I just thought, was so weak. And then it almost felt like they were trying to then use that to set up a relationship between Christopher Ree and Jill, the mother of David. Which they kind of did. Which seemed super forced. (laughs) Yeah. Which leads to this one random kiss near the Uh end for no reason. Because they both lost someone. Well, the reason is I'm going to blow myself up, so I'm going to kiss this blonde girl. (laughs) Why are you doing this? He wrote me this way. Yeah, none of their actions really make sense. Like, he doesn't seem that bummed out that his wife has committed suicide. He thinks of his daughter, who he clearly knows was responsible as kind of a jerk, but that's about it. Right. He's just like, oh, there she is, pain in the butt. And Linda Kozlowski, I like her. I feel bad that she made so few movies. You know, she's the one from, um... Crocodile Dundee? Yeah, she actually married Paul Hogan. Oh, okay. This is one of only, like, eight or nine movie credits that she has, because she retired from acting. Oh, fair enough. She had the most emotion, I felt like, out of most of the actors in this movie. What's weird is that they couldn't really figure out, do we have David connect with her, or do we have David connect with the guy who's not even related to him? Mm -hmm. Right. I almost wish that they had played up more him as a teacher, because we have so few scenes of him actually trying to teach the children. Yeah, once again, that would have been a really interesting angle, and they didn't do anything with it. I mean, because I know Dead Poet Society was around this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's have a large part of the movie just be set in the classroom as it's a human trying to connect with these inhuman aliens. Instead, you get the shortest school day ever where he shows up, talks about one thing, leaves to go talk to the principal. They kill the guy. Okay, school day's over. Yep. <laughs> and then they walk off. Yep. It felt like a real missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. I know the book does get into that more because what I love about the book is that it does a lot of kind of montage over the passage of time. Mm. In this one, it will just suddenly jump. It's suddenly like, okay, now it's a couple years later. Now it's several months mm-hmm. later. And it just keeps jumping over time instead of really feeling like it's flowing through time. And you don't get the impression of like they've been dealing with these kids for years or anything like that, however old they're supposed to be. Yeah. Let's just talk about, for a second, the great setup. The setup was great in the novel. It was great in the original. It was great here of just one day, this small town is suddenly surrounded by this invisible bubble, which everyone on the inside passes out. Which, of course, this time made me think of Under the Dome. Mm -hmm. King clearly took some influence there. (laughs) Oh, he admits it. He was like, what if everybody inside the bubble was okay and everyone outside was (laughs) And then they pass out and then they come to and every woman is pregnant. Mm -hmm. They do kind of gloss over things a little bit, but I like that you have the one woman who her husband was away who thinks that she was cheating on him. You have the teenage girl who's a virgin. 
families who just think that, oh, hey, we got pregnant. We have a normal pregnancy. And then as it dawns on them, they're suddenly questioning everything. Yeah, it was a really great setup. It's a shame that everything just kind of died off once the kids were born. But they had some really good stuff going there. I mean, even like the teen mother, they focus on her so much. And then it's like, oh, he just has a prevision of her committing suicide. And then we cut to her funeral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would have been nice to build on some of those characters more. It would have been. Even the novel written in 1957 had a lesbian couple. Oh, wow. Where one of them got pregnant and the other didn't. And then it actually explores like what their relationships were like. And I like how the novel really gets into like all the small town stories of just as this town is going over the course of these 10 years. Mm. It felt like it was just suggesting things without really dating you. Know, and to be fair, that's what Carpenter's plotting is like. Carpenter is more like, let's just kind of breeze through, suggest a bunch of stuff, have just a kind of nice lean plot in the middle. He doesn't feel like a Stephen King type of author where let's just settle down into a small town and learn about everybody. Yeah. I feel like this story kind of needed that a little bit. Yeah. More than what we got anyway. Yeah. And that's where it would have been interesting to see what Tom Holland would have done with Mm -hmm. it. Because I think he can do that much better. It doesn't feel like a Carpenter movie. No. No. I mean, it's well shot, so you can sort of see some things, but yeah, it's nothing like any of his other movies I've seen. It just doesn't feel like it fully gels with him. Mm -hmm. I think Creature from the Black Lagoon would have been a much better fit for him, but it's a shame that never happened. Yeah. Because it's a much leaner, more focused story. This one, it felt like it had too much to do and couldn't figure out what to focus on. Well, let's talk about Mark Hamill. I thought he was good. I thought he was fine. He didn't really have much to do. Like he was the priest who had a couple lines or whatever, which he delivered serviceably. And then suddenly he had a shotgun or a sniper rifle. And I'm like, oh, okay. He finally put those balls we saw on the other Carpenter film to use. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it was, I guess he was not quite the -the over-the-top preacher. Like he was mostly a good guy, but then... His wife was. Yeah, and that was the other thing too. Like when they first showed up, I'm like, okay, he doesn't have the Catholic priest collar. So I'm not sure who he's supposed to be. I guess she's a wife and not a nun. Like, I really feel like if they had gone for Catholic and she had been a nun, that would have been really interesting Mm -hmm. to have her get pregnant, too. Oh, yeah, have a priest and the nun gets pregnant and everyone thinks the priest might have done it. So I was kind of almost expecting that, but it was like, no, okay, they're obviously whatever kind of Christian that you're allowed to get married. Well, it does say he's a reverend here in the Reverend, okay. But no, I mean, he was fine. He just, Mm -hmm. once again, didn't have a whole lot to do until they made him shoot himself. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. People just kept appearing and reappearing in different places. Like, time didn't also really kind of gel for me in this. Like, Mm. the kids would be one place. They'd be across town. They'd be over here. Like, some characters would just kind of pop up and be like, hey, I'm sad. It was very much like in the mouth of Mattis. We'd be like, hey, buddy, I haven't seen you in a while. Now I'm going to kill myself. See ya. (laughs) I think it would have been much more effective if the kids were there and suddenly, like, one of them just takes a bullet. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, it would have been a shocking image, but it's not one that John Carpenter hasn't done in the past. I thought David was going to get it, the one good kid, but maybe I've just watched too much modern HBO. Uh, No, you you need to save him for a payoff. No no payoff, (laughs) no payoff, really. (laughs) He got away. My only issue with Mark Hamill is you can tell that this is a couple years after he started his voice acting career because he perfectly enunciates every (laughs) single word. Yeah. And it sounded like the Joker voice being a nice person. (laughs) <laughs> Hello, Batman. Are you here to pray tonight? Yeah, when he, when he started doing the sermon, there was a little bit. Of <laughs> it had that very animation voice actor sound to it. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, there was the pair three, his wife, who then suddenly is you know, leading the mob with torches and everything. Yep. She was just angry. Couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, I mean, it kind of came out of nowhere of, yeah. like, why she was... I mean, I guess because he died. I don't know. In the original, there was a character who leads a mob and is forced to set themselves on fire. So, I mean, that is an effective horror scene. But Why did the woman have to steal her keys off her dead body? Did she not have a vehicle? I don't know why they felt they needed to do yeah. that. Because it's like, I get it. You need to explain where her keys are for some reason. Because I think he took her car when he went, Christopher Reeve, maybe. I, I think know. they just wanted to show off the makeup effects. Which they already did when she walked over to put the thing on the car. Right, true, yeah. right. Yeah, that was just bizarre. I'm watching the movie silently and uh, the toy car just went into the flames. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me wonders, is there something in terms of, like, how the studio altered the editing at all? Right, yeah. But I I read the script. Everything plays out exactly how he wrote it. Hmm. And he says he's still fine with how the film turned out. It was more just how it was marketed that he had a problem with. This one just didn't come together. No. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, even the music is okay, but it sounds like the Dario Argento Goblin scores as an easy listening channel cover. Yeah, I could <laughs> see that. For the beginning, it sounded like a Nightmare on Elm Street rip, which I'm like, oh man, that's a bummer to hear because <laughs> Carpenter is his own thing. He had the very dun 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. With the children's choirs and stuff like that, very like Rosemary's Baby, and as you say, like the Dario Argento, yeah. Yeah, it was a little too Elm Street. It was a little overly Goblin, but again, it was Goblin goblin in a way that could be playing after a track by kenny g yeah <laughs> it was just a bummer to hear because carpenter is carpenter he's got a very distinctive sound with his score so it's weird to see him sound like someone else yeah and you think like carpenter and his melodies and atmosphere partnering up with the lead guitarist of the kinks and this is what we got <laughs> yeah my memory is that it gets better when he pairs up with buckethead and anthrax but we'll see <laughs> we will see wow well. I'm trying to think of what else we can bring up for this. Uh, Kirstie Alley. Alley. We didn't talk about her yet. Huh? Oh, yes. She is entirely added by this movie. Her character is not in any of the past ones. There was an army general in the original story who had a small part. You know, I find that she at least has more energy than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Which is interesting because she had both energy and also seemed like she didn't want to be there at the same time, which was kind of an interesting effect for me. I thought it was good because in reality, that person probably wouldn't want to be there. Right. Well, it's your typical carpenter put upon asshole who won't stop smoking even when they're standing inside of a hospital with children. Well, but she stopped <laughs> while she was helping to deliver the baby. So there's that. Well, that was nice of her. <laughs> I would have loved if she was down there between the legs and she just handed the cigarette to a nurse for a minute. <laughs> Hold on to it. Do not, do not let that go out. <laughs> Those cigarettes look like they were all filter too. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. They were yellow. Yeah. I don't know what was up with that. And then that's also a story that was added where the one baby was stillborn and she kept it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you both think of the puppet of the dead baby in the child? I think it Pretty was bad. so lifelike, I was terrified. I actually... <laughs> jumped out of my skin <laughs> no it's the worst thing i've ever seen yeah it was awful that's the type of effect that i expect when i see a movie with kmb in the uh. credits i don't know why they got as much work as they did uh. it was pretty mm. bad when you could have gotten screaming mad george and steve wang for the same budget i think you know part of it too is just the whole gray aliens are just so played out yeah and especially in the mid 90s they were x files was huge yeah, at this time that yeah. it was like couldn't you have gone with a slightly better design yeah oh, wow. something different when we know for a fact that none of the other kids were born looking like that right yeah like what happened with that one it just happened to not mutate properly yeah it doesn't make sense and then the whole thing of the kids going down and seeing it and then causing her to autopsy herself when she it's not like she even killed the baby and dissected yeah. it she just autopsied the dead body right it was already yeah she didn't do it while it was alive again it's mara is a cruel psychopath mm -hmm. yeah and like supposedly that was supposed to help David get over it, I guess. And then the thing about David is I wish they had found some better way to work his rescue in the climax because uh -huh. everything about that climax with him showing up, thinking about the brick wall and them shattering their way through the brick wall is almost shot for shot how it was done in the original. Yeah, I remember that. Except for the presence of David and her coming in to get David. So it's this wonderfully constructed sequence that keeps getting interrupted. And the thing is, we already saw that they fully have the ability to split up since two or three of them were at the autopsy and the others were first in the girl stuff. So why didn't like two of them turn around to control David and the woman and the other ones break through Christopher Reeve's mental blocks? Like they didn't have to keep switching back and forth. Here's something I would propose. We know that the kids here are getting strong enough that he shouldn't be able to block them that well. Mm -hmm. What if it's David that's standing in front of him and David is building the brick wall? That would be cool. That would be good too, yeah. And David sacrifices himself to try to save this professor and he gets overwhelmed by the other kids. And as soon as they break through David, they see the bomb, it goes off. That would I be would good, like yeah. that. Yeah. So David still doesn't survive the ending, but he goes down trying to save this man. Right. What's interesting to me is they also set up that he had a different mental blocking technique with the ocean. Yeah. And then suddenly it's no longer an ocean, it's a brick wall. So that was confusing to me. I know that they probably wouldn't have the effects to make like them trying to get through the ocean to see this bomb. But it was weird to be like, oh, yeah, our happy place is this ocean. I can use it to, like, block my thoughts. But now I'm not going to use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a brick wall from, like, a 1980s stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> 
you know what would have been interesting is if every time his daughter tries to break into his mind, he just pictures the bottom of the cliff. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that actually does start to build a degree of guilt in her, which of course she channels into resentment, which is why she starts to become more bitter and more bitter. Yeah. Because he keeps forcing her to revisit what she did when she was younger to her mother. How about we remake this movie? We're (laughs) We're on a better path here. I love Carpenter. He's good at character writing and sharp stuff, but he's not good for like doing a deep psychological study Mm -hmm. that I think this needed to be. And the earlier versions kind of are. Yeah. With his earlier movies, though, everything made sense. So he can show you very little, but you can get everything you need from that little. And still follow it. Yeah. But with this, no one's doing anything that makes sense. So your brain's like, well, maybe no, maybe no, no. (laughs) Yeah. Again, it's like there's so much there that he has to focus on that he doesn't know what to focus on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He can't find a thread. Because in the beginning, it was like a Stephen King story like we were talking about earlier. That's why I was intrigued because it had that King vibe. But yeah, I couldn't focus on anyone. I would love to see someone try another stab at this again because, you know, we are at a time where not every movie has to have giant monster scares and bloody deaths anymore. We can do a more low budget, trim, psychological horror movie. Honestly, I think you could make it into a TV series if you wanted. It seems like there's enough there with that small town. For sure. That you could like take your time with it and have the kids grow up. I was thinking like it would be an interesting rewrite because in the age of social media, there's no remote areas so much anymore. So it would be a really interesting way to look at it with today's technology and this sort of story. And yeah, it Mm. could be a TV show as well. My only problem is once it started showing its hand too much with the kids being malevolent and killing everybody, it's kind of like the original Child's Play where it's like you don't know if it's the little boy doing it or the doll doing it. Mm. And once it plays its hand, that mystery is gone. Yeah. That one novel that I mentioned, The Chrysalids, which is very similar to the X-Men, he wrote after writing this. So it's like, obviously, he was still intrigued by the idea of humans versus something that are inhuman Mm -hmm. and just kind of an inevitable conflict. But he wanted to do a story where let's remove the outside alien factor and just have it be that these are things that literally came from humanity. Right. And people that came from humanity who are in many ways still human and are just trying to live their lives. But humanity won't let them because humanity now feels threatened. Mm -hmm. I would love to see something that explores more how this is the starting point to a broader story like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like an X-Men or like, uh, what's that movie? Uh, Chronicle. But it doesn't have to go that cinematic route where it has to lead to like a big conflict. You can actually just explore what would happen as it went along. Yeah. I mean, speaking of big conflict, how about when the police and army show up? (laughs) (laughs) Super goofy. Mm -hmm. And they just get one guy to start mowing. (laughs) I mean, it was right after I watched The Dirty Dozen, so it kind of had like this weird (laughs) parallel to that, but this was not done very well. (laughs) No. I kind of loved the concept of it, of like a whole army comes over and they one by one tear it apart by turning all the soldiers on one another. Execution wise, it feels like that opening of Jason Goes to Hell where all the FBI shows up and shoots him into pieces. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you could have done something really cool like Magneto style where like everyone just turns and points their gun at each other and they all fall. That would have been cool. But this was just silly. (laughs) Again, it just didn't work. There's so much of this movie where I want to like it, but it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a shame, too. I'm not taking any pleasure in this. (laughs) (laughs) And this is, again, the one that he made right after In the Mouth of Madness. Weird. Yeah. Which, to be fair, we criticized a lot. But still. We did criticize In the Mouth of Madness, but In the Mouth of Madness is a love. much better with film. Love. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. much stronger than this, yeah. It had a bite to it. That This one just has no bite to it. No. Mm-hmm. It's a film about parents literally turning on their own children, and yet there's no bite to it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, even if the wife had, like, said something to Christopher Reeve of, like, you know that child is evil, you know, like, instead of her literally just walking off the cliff after looking sad for a minute, I don't know. No one even suspects. Right. It's either they're just, oops, I, like, dropped a bottle, now I have to die. Like, there's no uh, untrustworthiness between the parents and the kids. Mm -hmm. It's very peculiar. And then, like, the whole bit where the eye doctor just randomly has a bottle of caustic fluid right next to eye drops. Yeah, I had to rewind that because I'm like, wait, what did she even do (laughs) to make the kid so mad? She used the red-capped vial instead of the blue-capped vial. And why do you have it there? Yeah. She has contact lens solution. 
hydrochloric acid. That's just what <laughs> eye doctors have. And then we cut to the kid with the eye patch, but we never see that kid have an eye patch again. Yeah, nope. it just heals. It would have been cool if in that uniformity of them, you have one kid who just has now one milky white eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do like the idea of David becoming increasingly alienated from him. And I love that the mother, her lesson to him is just, well, now you know how other people feel mm -hmm. when they lose someone. And yet you kids are causing them to lose someone. Mm -hmm. I like that building of empathy. And I, I like how he's still so alien and stiff about it as he's trying to kind of uncover what happened. Mm -hmm. But it is still forging a connection with people right. that the other kids can't. Again, that's something that I would like to just see have more room to play out. There's a mm -hmm. lot of potential. A lot of potential. Yeah. Because I always like it whenever you have like groups of scary children that have, they're not, I, mean, I would love to see a story of an antichrist who doesn't want to be the antichrist. That's actually one of the reasons I love Damien Omen 2 more than the Omen is you have this great moment where Damien, who's like 12 years old, finally finds out who he is. And freaks out. Hmm. And he literally can't stand it. And he runs out. He like even runs down to a lake and starts screaming to the heavens, why me? And all that stuff. And then the film is literally about how these other forces corrupt him into accepting it. I think that's a fascinating character to explore instead of just, oh, she's evil. She'll kill you. Yeah. yeah. I get the whole thing of scary children, but I think I more prefer characters who are driven to choose that path than I am characters who are just evil. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, because just not having emotions doesn't automatically mean that you kill someone the moment they wrong you slightly. Yeah. A little subtlety, a little suspense wouldn't kill you. Yeah. And again, this is where we have time things. Like, I can understand the hot bottle thing. If you burn me, I'm going to make you burn you because it's still coming from an infant mind. Mm -hmm. Even if it's an alien intelligence, it's still an infant mind. Right. Yeah, it was extreme, but yeah, I get it. But I would love to have seen more exploration of as these kids grow, how they start to fall into how they choose to use their powers and have some kids are more cruel, some kids are more just reactionary, mm -hmm. some kids are more tit for tat, eye for an eye type thing. Some kids are kind of like, you did this wrong, but I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> Just know that you did this wrong. You know, you, I would love to. Yeah, if we did a TV series as the seasons go, have the uniform hive mind break into individuality. Yeah, right. that would have been cool. That would have been fascinating to explore. There's just so many missed opportunities in this. But again, it's a property and it's a setup that I'd love to see someone do more with. I'd love to see this be like a BBC series where we just get like six episodes every year, you know, just jump into where they are now. Mm -hmm. And you could still have it set in a rural British town. Mm. Right. That's kind of cool. Like the 7-Up series, you know, that documentary series? Oh, yeah. Oh. Except sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would actually be great. Yeah, jump in like every... And, and don't have them all die as children. Yeah. Have some continue living into adulthood yeah. and even old age. Mm -hmm. This does go back to the original novel, the whole concept that this didn't just happen in this town. This happened in towns all over the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And in some of the towns, the townspeople just killed them upon birth. and some, all the children were born stillborn. In some towns, they just nuke them off the map. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of this is a new species that is rising and is just trying to get a foothold, but they can't because they just can't get along with humans. Yeah. One other thing that I find amusing is Michael Perret is fourth billing and he dies in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the glorious reunion of John Carpenter and Michael Perret after the Philadelphia experiment. Short lived. I guess they yeah. were trying to take you by surprise with that, make you think he was going to have a bigger role. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pulling a Tom Skerritt. <laughs> oh, Tom Skerritt got much more screen time. That's oh, yeah. true. He did. Yeah. <laughs> They're pulling a Drew Barrymore. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Michael Perret is Drew Barrymore <laughs> in John Carpenter's Village of the Dead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to add before I jump into the box office and the actual release of the movie? I think we've covered everything pretty yeah, much. I think so. Yeah. Village of the Damned was released on April 28th, 1995. It opened at number five mm. with Friday debuting at number two. <laughs> oh, nice. And the second week of While You Were Sleeping was still at number one. <laughs> While You Were Sleeping was a huge movie. Everyone forgets that. Mm. Yeah. i never seen it. Nah. Oh, it's wonderful. I love yeah. it. Yeah. My mom loves it, so I see a lot. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'll see it if we ever bring our old podcast back to life. So the following week, French Kiss debuted at number one. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> bumping Village down to number nine. By the third week, Crimson Tide debuted at number one, and Village of the Damned no longer appears on the charts in its third week. 
it grossed only nine point five million against a budget of twenty two. Wow. So I have a question because you said that he didn't like how they marketed it. Was it that they didn't do it enough, or did he feel like they misrepresented it in the marketing? That the trailers just weren't cut well, and that they kind of just cut down the budget of the ad campaign. Okay. So they didn't get to do many ads. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't remember this being promoted back then much. I know that I only heard of it just because I knew the original. So it caught my ear. Right. But yeah, even then, I didn't see it until like a couple of years later at Blockbuster. Mm. And to be fair, I watched this movie. This isn't a movie that I feel should have done better than it did. No, yeah. It's a film that deserved a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fortunately. Sorry, John. So this is, I think, the downswing. And it is neat that he did have a period here where he was doing a film a year. From Memoirs of an Invisible Man up to Vampires. Mm -hmm. Every year he had a film coming out. And unfortunately, though, that he just didn't have the films that he had in the 80s to really give that any weight. Because mm. this is just, yeah, this is a step down from Memoirs of Invisible Man. Yeah. <laughs> and our next episode, we'll get to Escape from L.A., <laughs> which, again, we already recorded, so we know how that conversation goes. We did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I already changed my mind on it. <laughs> Anyone else have anything else to bring up? No, I think that pretty much covers it for... I think we did a pretty good job with what we had. Yeah. So that's Village of the Damned. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Again, check out the 1960s version. I highly recommend reading the novel. John Wyndham is an author who deserves to be rediscovered every couple of decades because his books are really, really good. I will have to check this out. Yeah. So otherwise, nothing else for Village of the Damned. I think that brings our episode to a close. It does. Even the movie that I have on in the background silently has ended. It's in credits. <laughs> yep, little David looking out the window forlornly. It's true. I kept expecting his eyes to flash just as a goofy stinger for the end. So did I, because that's what everyone did. Right. I know like half the children of the corn movies ended with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, this one little baby is okay. Evil eyes. <laughs> Cut the black. Let's yeah. go back to the corn. <laughs> but I like that they didn't because David didn't deserve that. No. So I think with that, let's just uh, thank you for joining us, Angie. Oh, thank you for having me. And yeah, where can people find you again? Phoenix Anu on Twitter is the easiest way. I did actually do some Castle Rock Companion again. I did sell recently. Yeah, I did read that. Yeah. Every now and then those pop up. Thank you again, Alex. No problem. And good night, everybody. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>